We're here with David Weber. He's an author. Uh, we're talking to him today about Safo. Mm -hmm. Is a book series he has, and we're just going to find out what, what it what it is. Well, um, Safehold is kind of my take on the Reformation in a science fiction setting. Um, basically, the human race meets some really nasty aliens who pretty much wipe us out. I mean, it's, it's a bad day. Uh, it takes them about 40 years because they're not that far advanced over us, but there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and one of the things that we discover is they don't seem to be real innovative. They're using ships that are brand new build that are identical to ships that we know are a couple thousand years old. And they haven't changed in the interim. Um, and if we'd had 50 more years before we met up with them, we could have took them. Mm -hmm. That's basically the way it works. Unfortunately, we didn't have the 50 more years. So the human government um, breaks a, a colony ship out. It's their last ditch effort to go and establish a colony in a faraway star system with the bad guys to get by that don't know about where we can rebuild. And they know that uh, the Gibaba are going to be looking to see if anybody got away. So they figure that they're going to have to renounce high advanced technology for maybe 300 years, long enough for the Gibaba to sweep the area they're in, not find them, and go away. Um, and they're, the last human fleet sacrifices itself. Uh, they know they're all going to die, they know they're all going to be destroyed, but the way that they fight the battle convinces the Gibaba they're all there was. That there wasn't a colony fleet for them to chase down. Okay. Um, and my hero, who is also the heroine um, of, the, of the book, is uh, a young naval officer. She's a lieutenant commander. Her name is Nimiwe Alvin. And she wakes up in this cave on a planet she's never seen before and finds out that she's dead. She's been dead for about 800 years. Um, and what happened is that she volunteered to serve on the flagship of the fleet she knew was going to be destroyed. And the reason she did is that she, was, she possessed something called a pica, which is an acronym for a Personality Integrated Cybernetic Avatar. Um, and if you want to, you can think kind of Terminator in terms of, of the, the, uh, the strength and the durability and so forth. One side its own little fusion plant, you know. But you can literally upload your personality into it. And what it's really designed for is things like uh, extreme sports. You really want to go scuba diving at the bottom of Mariana's Trench, climb into your pipe that you can go, and then you can upload the memory of having done it. If you want to go hang gliding from 80,000 feet, sure, okay. no problem. You don't need to breathe, you know, kind of thing. You're a pica. Well, she was supposed to go with the colony fleet to the planet that becomes Safehold, which is where the Safehold series takes its name from. But the commander of the the close escort, you might say, for the colony fleet, the light ships that are sent along to kind of light like herd on it, is the brother of the commander of the fleet that's destroyed, covering, covering the retreat. And she knows both of them. And they had realized that the guy who's been chosen as the administrator for the colony does not have both oars firmly in the water. They're worried about what he's going to do when he's out here in charge on his own. And they're kind of afraid that he's going to try and say, okay, technology is what got us into trouble, therefore we can never have technology again. Um, and that's not what the original mission plan was. That's what they're afraid he's going to try to do. Mm -hmm. And so Minyue agreed to be killed, in effect, because she had the pica in her baggage, and everyone thinks that it was taken to the ship that she was killed on, so nobody's looking for it to trash it when the time comes. 
The problem is that by the time it occurred to them they could do this, she didn't have time to do another memory upload. So she doesn't remember making any of these decisions. There's a recording from her, her beloved Commodore who, who tells her what happened. And it turns out that the, the uh, Lang Eric Langhorn, who was the administrator for the colony, the colonists had all agreed to give up high technology, okay? But human nature is human nature. And they figured, you know what, yes, I'll give up that high technology until the first time I have to cut down a sequoia, at which point I want my atomic power to chainsaw that, okay? So, the colonists all agreed to have their memories altered so that they didn't remember high tech. technology. Okay. Now, they were still supposed to be them, okay? They were still supposed to have their basic memory structure intact. You know, this is the person I married to, who I love, you know. Etc. There were no children, and the reason there were no children is because they had to make the trip in cryo suspension, and children can't do that. You have to be like at least 18, 19, I think, before you can survive using the cryo sleep technology that they have. So basically, you have the terraforming fleet, which is sent in to prepare the planet, and there's two of them. There's one that stays with the colony ships and one that actually goes to do the planet. And that's in case the Gababa come along while they're working on the planet. They still have another fleet. They go for another 150 light years and try over again. And the whole idea is that once they move into the planet, then the entire colony fleet and everything gets tossed into the local sun so that there's not a bunch of artifacts floating around up there in space. Um, and the colonists will be, the, the, the original command crew, will have uh, enclaves on the planet. They're really only supposed to have one. They wind up having more than one. Um, where high tech will be preserved very carefully, like deep underground, where nobody's going to pick up the emissions, you know, that kind of thing, until the 300 years pass, at which point they'll begin re-educating everybody on the planet. The colony fleet builds whole villages, and, you know, prepares farmland, the whole nine yards. Well, what happens is that when Langhorn turns up at the colonists and they wake up, the colonists have not been programmed simply to forget about high tech. They've been programmed to believe that this is the first day of creation, that they've opened their eyes fresh from the creating hand of God, mm. and that the command crew are archangels, and God gives them rules about the technology they can have. And basically, anything that doesn't rely on wind power, water power, or muscle power is forbidden, okay? And they've written this entire thing called the Holy Writ. And the Holy Writ does a lot of really good things, and it's, among other things, it's a complete manual on how to terraform the planet, how to reclaim the land that hasn't already been, how to consecrate the unconsecrated land so you can put food crops into it and whatnot. And there are religious explanations for everything that you do. Okay, like um, if you are a Pasquale, the, the Archangel Pasquale was the healing Archangel. So there's the book of Pasquale and it tells you, okay, before you do surgery, you have to clean your instruments with the holy carbolic acid. If you don't, you will be cursed. Infections will set in and your patient will die. Okay, <laughs> so I mean, they, they tied everything up like this. There's no loose ends. Not only that, there are eight million colonists and they're all literate. And they, you've got all these people who left journals and memoirs about the first day of creation. I opened my eyes, it was the archangel, you know, kind of thing. There's the word atheist doesn't exist on this planet. Uh, now, in addition, the colonists had all received the life extension therapies, okay? So they're gonna live like for another 150 years after they get here, but they're not getting the boosters, which the command crew is. So the, the original colonists are gonna live about 150 years, and then their kids are gonna have like normal lifespans, making maybe to 70 or 80. Okay, the command crew will live 300 years. All right, so basically what you have here is this kind of defense in that you will live longer than your children because you are Adam and Eve, you know, kind of thing. And the archangels, these bodies were just made for us to interact with you here and make sure everything got started right. And eventually because they're made out of 
mortal materials, they too will corrupt and die. But we'll live, you know, 50 years longer than you will, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. So all of this is in place. And so when she wakes up 800 years later, there is no advanced technology. Okay, well now the problem is that if there's no advanced technology and no explanation for why there's no advanced technology except God doesn't like it, if technology ever does emerge again and we go back out into space, we won't know the Gibaba are waiting for us, which would be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that in fact was one of the primary reasons that um, Dr. Pei Shan Wei, uh, who was the head of the, um, the terraforming expedition and the wife of the Commodore, that, okay. That's the main reason she set up the Alexandria Enclave, which was down on this island, down in roughly a little bit, about where Antarctica would be, but not quite that icy. Um, separate from the main enclave, because she kind of suspected mm -hmm. that, that they were going to do this. Um, and when she refuses to um, surrender and destroy all of her technology because she's afraid we'll get technology again, we'll go out and meet the Gibraltar, they kill her and everybody in the Enclave with a kinetic bombardment from space. Um, and the books are basically about how she does that. Okay, and who she finds as her allies, and and and, and it, what the books are really about uh, when you come right down to it is freedom of conscience. Okay, I mean, this is uh, a world in which no one has ever questioned the teachings of the church, mm -hmm. but it's also one in which the church has become increasingly corrupt, and people who want to reform the corruption within the church are branded heretics or whatever by the church leadership to justify squashing them. Okay? So even people that they don't want to be heretics, they just want the church to be what the church is supposed to be according to the Holy Writ. Um, and once religious warfare starts, if the church can't crush the reformers quickly, then it begins to snowball and it turns into something a lot more dangerous to the church than just we want to reform the abuses, which is obviously what happens. Um, now, ultimately, I want to get back into space and have humanity beat up on the Gibaba again, because they got it coming. Mm -hmm. And also, I know exactly who the Gibaba are, I know why they're stuck where they're stuck. If they are, I know why they react the way they react. But none of that is germane to what's happening on the planet right now. So, I've just finished um, last September um, at the Sign of Triumph, which is the final volume in the first Safe Hold cycle. I think some people think that it's, oh, that's the end of the series. No, it's not. It's the end of the first sub-series. Okay. Okay. Then there will be probably another five books set on Safe Hold beginning 20, 30 years later um, and ending with the final resolution of the struggle against the church. The, the, at the Sign of Triumph ends with the church still intact. Okay, it's, it is reformed and so forth, but there are also, there's a schismatic church, the Church of Cheris. It's called that because it's from the kingdom of Cheris. That's where Merlin goes, where the Church of Cheris originates. And the Church of Cheris is accepted by the new leadership of the Church of God awaiting, that's the, the official church, as non-heretical, even though it's no longer figures that it's going to do what the Grand Vicar wants it to do. Okay. Um, so that's kind of a stopping point. It's only halfway to where the reformers need to go because they have to break the church's power completely if they're going to. But basically what happened is the good guys in the Church of God awaiting managed to stage a coup against the villains. 
And unless the good guys want to say, oh, by the way, we're really fighting to completely destroy the church because we don't believe in God according to the Holy Writ at all. Okay, they do believe in God. They just don't believe in the Holy Writ. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for most people on Safe, well, there's no difference. Right. Um, and so they've never, they've never lied to anybody. Okay, but they also have never told anybody the complete truth. People keep calling Merlin a sage, and his response is, well, that's what people say I am. <laughs> because most sages never called themselves sages while they were alive anyway. But he's trying to create a situation in which anybody who he does bring into the full story isn't going to say, and you lied to me for 15 years beforehand. He's going to say, no, you know, I told you the exact truth. It's just like Jack Nicholson says in A Few Good Men, you know, you, you, you can handle the truth at that point, now you can. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, At the Sign of Triumph, which I think is volume nine, I'm not sure, is not, as some people seem to think it was supposed to be, the end point for the series. Hopefully, like I say, I'll do the next four or five, mm -hmm. and then get them into space to go after the Gebab. Um, and probably the Gibaba right now I'm thinking probably wrapped up in maybe three books because I know, you know, essentially what, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that's a total of eight books and I turn 65 in October. <laughs> so assuming everything goes well, I can, I can get them all done. If I get to the end of the next cycle with the church being overthrown, and I don't think that I'm going to really be up for doing the war against the Gibaba, because if I can't do it right, I don't want to do it at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so either I need to find somebody else who I think could work with me to do the story if I'm running out of energy and time to do it, uh, or else what I need to do is in the final book of the second cycle, in the epilogue, have the fleet leaving to go defeat the Kibaba, uh, you know, and make it clear that that's what's going to happen, uh, and then not fight the war at all. I really would prefer to fight the war, and I know a lot of my readers mm -hmm. wouldn't really, really like to see it done, but I'm not going to do it unless I can do it right. This past fall, I pushed way too hard in way too many ways, and I really and truly hit a wall. And for three months for work, I was totally unable to write. Uh, and I'm not totally satisfied with the edit that I did on the two books that I was working on at the time, both of which have come out. Um, I think that I could have done a better job, but I had 12 days to do the final page proofs on 600,000 words mm -hmm. worth of novel. And I was hanging on by my fingernails to get it done and so right. as I got it done like Sharon would tell you I just pretty much collapsed like, seriously I was losing whole days in my memory and like that so two things one is I don't think my readers would like it if I wrote two more books and dropped dead as opposed to not writing 11 books at the end and still being here to write the 15 before I get there Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that I'm not going to push so hard that what I'm doing, I'm not satisfied, is my best work. Um, and I hope that if I get to the point where what I'm doing doesn't satisfy me as being my good work, that I'll hang my jersey up, uh, you know, at, at that point. Um, I've done a lot of collaborations mm -hmm. in my life, uh, more than a great many other authors. I won't do them just to generate more output. I won't do them just to get a book out there, or, oh, it's been six months, I haven't, haven't done that. I'll do it only when I'm convinced that the final book is going to be at least as good as either of us would have done alone. Individually. Individually. Um, I'll do it when I expect to learn something or teach something, and I've learned something from everybody I've ever written with. Um, but sometimes, especially if you have a writer who is a first novelist or has only done a couple of books, they can learn things from you too mm -hmm. in the process. 
And I'll do it to tell a story that I really want to tell that I don't have time to tell by myself, where I need to get somebody else in here to help me tell the story. And that last point might be an argument in favor of a collaborative safe hold series after I've got the church beat. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, do, I'm doing a novel now that's uh, a collaboration uh, with a guy who has, um, I think, a half dozen um, uh, self-published novels out. Um, I think he's very good. Um, this will be our first collaboration, and I'm not even going to look at it till I get done with my current project, which is Uncompromising Honor, the next Honor Harrington book. Um, but I think that it could very well be the beginning of an entire new series, which would be written with, with him, with Jacob, um, and which would have certain advantages over the other series that I've done because the way it's being set up, you don't have an overarching story arc that's going from point A to point B. Um, it would be more a case of novels with ongoing characters who are growing and developing experientially. Um, but each novel, they'd be dealing with a different problem, mm -hmm. not the repercussions of the last one that they saw, which is what happens in the Honor Harrington books and the Safe okay. books, because that's the way real life is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've come up with, I think, a concept here which will let me get beyond that and make each of them unique. But I've got the Safe Hold series, I've got the R. Harrington series, I've got the Multiverse series, which other people think of as the Hell's Gate series. Um, I've got the, the Sword of the South, the Fantasy series. Um, I've got the uh, Travis, uh, the, uh, Travis Long series with uh, uh, Tim Zahn and Tom Pope. I mean, I've got some enough to keep away. me busy. Yeah, people say, you know, you should really if you're, finish a series. I'm like, okay, which one should I stop so I can do these? I'm like, don't stop that one. That's my favorite. No, you can't stop this one. That's my favorite. So, you know, I'm kind of damned if I do, damned if I don't.